Hello and welcome finally to the English version of my Cube 2 editing tutorial. Yeah, um, because the demand for it was very high, uh, for the tutorial series to be released in English, I finally took some time to actually uh, record and write this tutorial. So, yeah. In the, uh, the, the the most demand for the English version of the Cube 2 tutorial was, if I remember correctly, for the scripting tutorial. But today we will focusing on the modeling part. So I will release this part by part as I did with the German version. So in the first part we will deal around. Uh, we, 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 we will deal with um, modeling. In the second we will deal with some texturing and stuff and all the things. Are, which are um, well nice to know. So yeah, um, because the German version of the tutorial or, or the the parts of the German tutorial were sometimes a little bit too long. Uh, also, like my first attempt to make the English version of the modeling part, I try to keep things short and on point. And not to waste a lot of time with tinkering around and stuff. So yeah, I hope I can I, I, I can keep this as short as possible. So yeah, that's it. Today we start with modeling. So yeah, first of all, if we want to model a map inside Cube, or if we want to create a single-player campaign, for example, whatever, the map comes first before the scripts. Um, yeah, we obviously need to create a new map. For this we have two different options. If we press T, we can bring up the little command or the little text prompt below here with T. Um, we can write slash map and then we could give our map a name. This is nice. This will... Well, actually this command slash map does try to load a map called edit tutorial in this case but if the or but if a map file with this name is not found the engine or cube 2 on its own will just create a default empty map with this edit tut name with the default size which is important because if we want to create a new map we have let me think, I think 4 to 32 different sizes how big the map can be. I quickly demonstrate this with a second command which is called new map. With this command new map we just create a new map and we can only pass the number from two, uh, 4 to I think it was 32 to tell the engine which size our map is but we cannot give our map a name this is this need to be needs to be done later so if we just use map on a map which is not existing the engine will create a default size empty map I think the default size is 12 and we will have a name but if we use new map we can only give the size but not a name so the default name if we will save our map will be unnamed which is well not what we want so with new map we can choose how big our new map is so for example if i write new map 4 you will get this new empty map which is as you can see pretty small you can also use new map for example 8 and you see it's a big a little, little, little bit bigger you can say 16 or you can say 20 or we can say 32 which is the largest map I think so we see it's pretty 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 west but I do not recommend to use the largest map size possible so I always recommend think first of what you want to build, how much size you need for it and 
try to keep things as small as possible for various reasons. Some optimizations we will run later does not work on maps which are too large and also if we later on start placing lights we will also have some issues if we have too a, a, a map which is too vast or we have too many light sources on a map these pre-rendered shadow maps will fail at some point so keep the map size as big as necessary but as small as possible so we just create a new map with new map let's say 12 which is for the tutorial series everything we need it's not the smallest map but it's I think big enough okay so um, if we now want to save the map we can hit f5 but, we, but as we see the map will be saved as untitled.org so our map does not have a name for this we need to issue the command slash save map and now we can parse a name of our map edit tut so now our map will be saved as edit tut.org but the map we are currently working at is still the map untitled. So if I now use the quick save button with F5, you see, oops, what the wrong button. Uh, we see it's still um, untitled OEG, uh, o -O -G -Z. So if we use save map and with the name edit tut we just stored our map in a file name called like we already uh, as we described it so now we just use the command slash map and then we use edit tutorial with we hit um, the tab key we can auto complete this thing here our new uh, our previous stored map will be loaded automatically I want to um, illustrate this by uh, new map let's say one which is mm, very small so I want to save this um, yeah, I want uh, yeah let's make some modification here this wonderful pillar uh, pillar and then we uh, just say save map test now we have saved this as test and if we now hit F5, we, st we see it's still, st still stored as untitled. So we could, for example, open the map untitled. And we see this little thing here is still there. Or we can now also open the map test. It is the same map. And then we can open the map edit tutorial, which is our MD but vaster map. Yeah. So much for saving and loading the map. If for some reason, if you can see here, your game mode on the left side, co-op editing, is messed up, for example, with free for all. I just demonstrate this. With the game mode zero, and then we will open the map edit tutorial. We see we are in the free for all game mode and we have a countdown timer of 10 minutes. If for whatever reason this game mode is messed up and you start editing, your map will end in 10 minutes and all changes changes made which are not previously saved will be lost. So in order to correct your game mode you can just type slash mode 1. 1 is the edit mode which is not yet applied first need to load a new map um, like this and now the mode is the correct mode so we can summarize this if you change the game mode the game mode will only uh, will, will be first applied on the next map you will load not on the map you're currently on or currently playing so changing game modes is always um, bundled with loading a new map. 
So, okay. We are in our edit mode. The edit mode, for, uh, by the way, can, you can tell you the edit mode with E, E for edit, which is only working in, I think, every game mode except of the single player game mode. Slash SP, single player. Edit tutorial, for example, will open our map as a single player map. Um, the special thing about the single player mode is that now our custom scripts we uh, may have declared, uh, not the possible yet, mode 1 map editor. If we have some custom scripts inside here, um, not all things written inside your map CFG file will be executed in a single player map. This includes triggers for a map object, so if you move through a map object, some script is triggered, that this will only work in single player modes. Monsters will only work in single player mode. Um, level triggers, for example, if you want to end or load a new map. They will only work in single player mode and everything which is not made to modify the assets used in a map are not executed. This also unfortunately includes doors. At least I don't... No, no, doors won't work because if you have doors placed on your map or am I nuts? Uh, don't cut me on the door part. I'm not pretty sure. I need to look that up. But most things written in the CFG files in non single player modes will not work. Just things like modifying sound files, modifying the textures, or modifying models, which are used for this maps, are work. There are some commands called uh, texture. Texture reset, for example, this would reset our whole texture browser. We have here, no, uh, here, for example. It's just it's, it's, it's just an example. Um, save, execute. Texture, texture. Okay, I'm not sure how this thing is called. However, so save. There are some commands which are used to reset the uh, re reset the textures or reset the models and stuff. These are commands which are executed in the non single uh, in, in the non single player modes. But this is nothing we deal today with. This is for the Crystal tutorial. So yeah, today we want to focus on actual editing. So, if you want to edit a map, we already know how to open a map, and we see this little selected square here, which is the active cube we have selected. If we, for example, now move the mouse wheel up or down, we can extend or uh, we can pull or push the geometry in the direction the white lines are facing or in the direction the selected face is facing. So for example if we have a larger region selected we can do so by holding down the left mouse button and just dragging the view. We see we will we, we see we can select a region which can we now extend in the direction this face the selected uh, face of the region is facing. This goes for both directions, push and pop. So, as you may have noticed, if we have a region selected, um, the push and pop direction is not determined by the actual cube we are facing, like if we have nothing selected in this case. If I now pull the things, you see is it's always pulled in the direction of the curler I already I, I currently facing, which is a bit annoying sometimes. So for this we want to select 
uh, a distinct region and we would just want to push a puppet without uh, hesitating where we look at. So if you may have also seen right now is we can submit the we we can single click with the left mouse button one cube and also select another cube with the right mouse button and the engine will automatically spend an area between both selected cubes to um, yeah to be selected. Also what we notice is that we have this small red cube below here which is the origin of our selection which is necessary for several things. Um, I will explain later. So yeah, we know how to push, pop and select things. We have discussed naming, uh, save, saving, loading maps, F5, quick save and things. So okay. Also, if we have selected something like this, or we have modeled something more detailed, we can also move the whole selected geometry by holding down shift and then move your view. As you see, the thing is only moving in the um, in the in the in the directions your selected face is uh, pointing to uh, to and from uh, away from. So if I select this side of the selection and hold down shift, you see I can move it like this. If I hold this, I can move it like this. If I select this one, I can only move it in this direction. Oh no, I just uh, told, told, told some bullshit. It is determined by the face you're currently watching it before hitting shift. So now I'm um, I'm watching at the top of the selection I only can move this, uh, this thing in this area. So uh, in, the, in, the, in the bottom area. If I watch to the side like this and press, and press shift I now can move it up and down and left and right. If I look on that side I can move it back and forth and up and right. And the same goes for the for, for the for the for the bottom and so on. So yeah. We can furthermore we cannot just we, we cannot only move the selected geometry, we can also move just the selection without modifying the actual geometry. By um, clicking the right mouse button, we can just drag and drop our selection somewhere else, if we wish to, but not the geometry within the selection. If we want to clear a selection, we can just hit, simply hit space. So if we have done our modifications and just done to make sure we don't accidentally move it, we can just hit space and now everything is good to go. Yeah, okay. We can do a little, but that's not all, we can do a lot more things. For example, we can change the grid size. You see this different sized uh, gray squares of this default texture. If we hold down the G button and moving the mouse wheel up or down, we can change the grid size, the default grid size of our selection. So we can model different sized parts of our map, for example, if I want to build a um, tower, let's do this. I select the um, ground, let's make it a little bit bigger. I can select the ground and just pull the geometry out. And now if I want to add some little walls on the top, I can just use a smaller selection or grid size and just select this region. Or for example, just like this to make things go a little faster. So I have quickly designed a short wall. And on that wall, if I wish to, I can add even smaller little things <laughs> to make it look a lot more like a um, tower, a medieval tower. So. So, because we are lazy, we don't want to push and pop and extend every single cube on its own. We want to just copy this whole thing we already modeled 
to the other side like this. For this we select the geometry we want to copy and simply hit C for copy. Then we need to take care of what our origin is because if we now paste our selected geometry it will always start at the geometry point we selected. So for example if I would paste it now the whole thing would be paced along this cubes inside the wall. But we don't want it, we want it to sit on top, so we extend one cube to make the origin sit above here and then simply hit V to paste and we see we have the whole thing copied. Also, we can rotate things. So you see, I have already modeled this this little wall extension, let's call them like this, but I feel like, okay, I want to rotate them. I select the whole thing, then it's now important which um, which selected, uh, which which face is selected, which, which direction is selected, and now I can hold down the R key on the keyboard and then simply move the mouse wheel and we see the whole thing will, will be rotated um, by 90 degrees which is pretty nice. So for example if we just want to mirror this thing and this thing to this side and this side back there we just can copy the whole thing, move our selection one cube up, paste it, click the upper side, hit R, rotate the whole stuff. Uh, I think something went wrong, I'm not sure. Then we just can get our selection back down here and we simply had copied the whole thing from here to all the four uh, to all the three other sides which is a pretty good feature if you have more complex models than this simple tower selected okay so we know about how to clear a section how to change the grid size to push and pop selections and which the active active region is a region is but that's not all. We can also flip geometry. For this, I will copy the whole tower. Z, uh, C, move the whole thing, move the thing up a little bit, paste it. So we have a second tower. And now I want the tower to be upside down. For this, I select the bottom face of the tower and just hit X to flip the geometry from the bottom uh, from the from, from the from the upper side of the selection to the lower size of the direction or the other way around like we see here you can also do it by selecting these faces so we would uh, mirror the side from there to there and from there to there which we currently not see for this I will now make some make a hole inside our tower to better illustrate things so now you can also oops mirror the front and the back sides like you can see here or this side you see this the, the, the hole is uh, moving a little bit left and right so we can so easily so we can easily mirror or let's call it flip geometry we've already have designed if we feel like oh no I want it to be somewhere else if we just want to to, to, to have this gap 90 degrees rotated to this we just select the the, the, the the bottom or the upper face and just hold R and then we can just rotate the thing like this pretty easy like I think okay if you may have already seen cube maps or sauerbrat maps are not only built out of cubes like this they have also some rounded corners some, some edges and stuff and also this can be easily done by choosing a proper grid size like this and then I want to make the, 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 the top of this tower to be a little bit wider than the, than the bottom. So I will first decrease the size 
of our tower by one cube. Like this. So, and now we can start, oh I messed things a little bit up, we just we need it like this, this, and this, and this. So, okay, if we want to make some rounded corners or at least not cubic, uh, or, or at least not want our map to be built completely out of cubes like Minecraft, we can hit the middle mouse button or the mouse wheel and have this subgrid selection. We can extend by dragging the camera. And you see the half of the cubes are selected. I will demonstrate it on the bottom corner here. And if we now move the mouse wheel up, you see we can push the geometry inside the half of the ge geometry inside this direction. And also we have only eight different stages to actually modify the gradient of the edge. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is um, independent of the grid size you have selected. So if I have a larger grid size like this, it's still eight sub steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's always eight. So you just know. Okay. So I want to finish this. So I start dragging this and push the edges. Push the edges. And push the edges. So our tower starts to look a little bit well more detailed. Also I want to do this on the side. For this I select I, I'm doing the same like before. Oh fuck. Uh, the, this this the sub grid selection is sometimes a little bit well not so nice to do. It's not so easily Extend like this selection by simply hitting the ref, uh, the, the right mouse, right mouse button. You always need to drag things, which can be sometimes a little bit annoying if you have larger edges to modify like this, and you're too close or too far away, and yeah, you can easily, um, yeah, accidentally move your grid selection faster as you initially thought initially want so okay so we have some more or less rounded corners we have of course a lot more time we can just doing some more sub steps to make it actually round in the corners but for now we leave it like this okay wonderful okay so now we know how to modify the edges but that's still not all. If you may already had seen or noticed, keeping track of what your geometry of your map is really watching, especially on, on this gray textures, on gray texture, on gray texture with no much variance in the color or texturing or without shadows or, or things, it can be hard to keep in mind how your map actually looks. To make things a lot easier, we can hit the on the keyboard the, the, the number 7 to toggle these outlines and you see the actually visualized triangle the triangle light geometry of your map. We see that the map is built out of a lot of triangles and different sizes and so on. Yeah. Also we see that our edges here are represented as uh, as, as um, triangles, for example, if I pull out these edge here, we see that we have some different shaped triangles to actually make this face look like it looks. Okay. As you can see, if you did a lot of editing, it could be that some fragments like this remains. 
This is something we want later on to fix with the optimized geometry button you may have already found. If we go over to hit escape, go to editing, map and hit optimized geometry, the engine tries to build your whole map on as big as possible triangle. So you see our tower now is built out of let's say this, this, this whole thing is built out of one two ten triangles and before it were, it, it, there were let's say 15 or hundreds of triangles and so the map geometry got a lot easier. Of course if you have some smaller cubes on, on, on some bigger cubes, some things like this still happen because there is no much way to optimize it, but um, yeah, it's pretty good actually. So, okay. Now we know how to make basic editing, but what if we want to make some valleys? Or if we want to make some hills and we don't want to extend the cube, push it down, extend the next cube, push it down to, yeah, Build an um, in, in in hill by a, by ourselves, but also here the cube engine offers some nice tool which is called high map or hike map. We can toggle it with H, and you see our cursor will turn green. And now we can simply with scrolling the mouse wheel up or down create hills or even valleys like this so on and you can just make a look uh, make uh, makes the map look more realistic because we have some we have some we have some hills and so on and it's not all in a plane which is i think pretty fast way to do um yeah this but the high maps came with some way well, with some trade off if we are in the high map mode, like you can see here, you can, uh, for example, toggle the high map mode by, um, by by pressing the space button. With H, we are enabling the the high map mode. With space, we exiting the high map mode. If we hit H multiple times, we see it just um, creates our hills and um, valleys with like we did before with the mouse wheel. So okay. The actual trade-off of the high maps are first, if we accidentally make a hill in the near of already modified geometry, we see that sometimes there can appear some gaps around, or if we do it here, well, no, I need to modify this a little bit to show you the actual issue. So if we now build our high maps here you see we can override geometry we already had built. We don't want this. So if we want to have our hills and valleys in a certain area it is a good idea to first select where we want to place our hills, then hit the H key, we also see our selection turn screen, and now we can easily make our our mountains or whatever we are wishing to do, and we see they got cut off at the end of our selection. So like so using these um, pre-selected areas where we want the the mountains to be, we can avoid accidentally overriding the uh, geometry we already had build. So the trade-off is in order to make hills well actually fit to a geometry we built before we need to manually customize the edges like this or this and so on to make it look that the hill is someone connected with the actual tower and stuff but you also see this can be sometimes also a little bit complicated to achieve yeah also some things like this can happen that the, that the texture starts to stretch for this we need to um, make sure that we push and pop the right edges you see 
Now it is not stretching. If I push the cube from the upper side down and then move it into the cube, you see the, the texture starts stretching and so on. So yeah, making proper mountains, which fits into the rest of the map you designed could be sometimes a bit, well, difficult. Yeah. Another trade-off of our Haim high maps is if we use different grid sizes to create them. So for the first mountains I used the grid size 1. You can see it below here which grid size you have selected. Half, fourths, eighths, sixteenths. Sixteenths is the smallest while... Ah, it's depending on the cube you have selected. Yeah, also this is the smallest. This is the biggest selection, depending on what cubes you already facing. So, if I now do a high map, which is built out of the smaller grid size like this one, and I start doing my mountains, la 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 la, la because I'm so funny. You see? Ah, here. Sometimes some artifacts like this could appear because we have only eight different steps in determining, uh, in telling the engine how our edges are pushed. There are sometimes, there, there's sometimes no way to seamlessly transition this grid size with these eight steps edge push and popping to the other grid size and so artifacts like this could easily appear or even some gaps like this. Yeah, if we have something like this we can fix this either doing manually removing the cubes which are misplaced or filling gaps or if we hit the F3 button while in the high map mode we have here some brushes which determine the shape of the hills we do. So for the hills we used, we had this brush, but we could also use this brush, which will result in a bit different high maps. You see we have some less um, sub steps at the, at the edges. For example, if I use now this brush, we see that sometimes feels a bit more detail. I'm not sure how, how, to, how to describe it, but um, you'll notice if you work with it. And we have also this, which just only pulls, cert pulls certain single vertices, like you can see here, up and down and not a complete region. Or if we use the square mechanic, we see the hills try to um, tr try to be in a cubic shape and not in a, in, in a shape like this. And so we have different sizes. So if we want to fix things like this, we have these smooth tools, which are pretty nice, which sometimes can fix the issue. Not always, but sometimes. So if we use the smooth tool and we try to smooth things and we see that some of the artifacts disappeared and the engine tries to flatten the geometry to make these, um, these, these, these um, the angles between the different faces as small as possible to have a well smooth experience of the actual hills. Like this. This is always good to um, use after you have done modeling some mountains and you see you have some heavy gaps like this. You can start trying to flatten the whole thing a little bit with the correct brush size of course. And you see things get a lot uh, get a lot better and you have not so those those sharp edges like here or here yeah that's always a good thing to do okay we know how to use the brushes the brushes so okay optimized geometry we 
also already discussed. So the next thing on my list is toggle outlines. We already had toggle outlines. We have also a wireframe mode. The wireframe mode onto its own is for the pure mod, 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 map modeling not necessary. But later on if we do some optimizations it is good to have this wireframe view. Um, for example for the so-called PVS I will explain later. Okay. Another thing which is important to know is how in the world do you model stairs and ladders. So first I need to carve the inner side of this tower to make it empty inside. I think it's a bit a little too, de too deep. Ba, 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 ba. But it looks like the right hike though. Okay, so we just make a door. We can walk in and walk out easy. So if we now want to break, uh, make some stairs to move up there, we have two different options. First, we could just model some stairs or ladders. Ladders and stairs always function the same way. First of all, in the default cube engine, there is no mechanic to move vertically up and down. You always will build stairs in the one or other shape. So to demonstrate this, if I have some cubes like this, I can not move over them. If I use a little bit smaller grid size like this, I can now move over them. So the engine determines on the uh, how, no, if you can move up or down some geometry like this is always determined on the size of the face you're running against. So if you want to build stairs or ladders you need at least have um, faces which are not bigger than this. I'm not sure which, which actual grid size this really is because it's one because Here's one, here's 32. Well, the actual grid size is always determined by the face you, by, by the grids you're currently looking at. So yeah, it's a bit difficult to tell which size it is, but you can easily find out by just placing some different size cubes and check if you can walk over them. So everything which is this size or even smaller can be walked over. We can walk over, walk over, walk over, we cannot walk over. So, okay, if we build stairs, you see, we just make some things which just work like this. So we have geometry which is slowly increasing. So to build a stair, we just, first of all, we choose the size our stair or our steps should be. Select the ground and push it. Select the ground and push it. Select the ground, push it. Select the ground, push it. Select the ground and push it. Select the ground and push it and so on. So now we have a simple stair. So building ladders is done the same way, but the increase and in the angle of your actual stair is a lot, well, smaller uh, or bigger. Well, um, I show it to you. So. If we want to build a ladder, for example, say we want to have stairs which have this size, eh? for example, as so you can walk over. So, okay, first of all, we want to build the borders of our ladder. For this, I will extend, let's say, we start here. I will draw the borders. Oops. The border. So, if I would now do different stairs like this, take where the origin is. Okay, 
ist. Äh. Now I'm confused. Paste. 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 So, this will not work as a ladder. This is just a wall because there is no difference between the depths of the stairs. So, we want to model our ladder. So, we start pushing the edges to make it somewhat lean on the wall. One, two, one, two, three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, ah. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the last one is eight. So, this is the first part. Now we need the whole thing mirrored to the other side. So we copy it, move it here, paste it, flip it, and flip it again. And now we just copy this whole thing up here. Oops. And so we start easily making a ladder. So now we need to adjust the stairs. With this I will first remove the stairs I already did because they and aren't working anyway. So okay, we start making our stairs. Oh, we don't need this. This isn't the right shape, so we just keep till take this. Oops. We also can for sure select the larger region. Copy it. Then we can move the selection paste it then again move the selection and paste it and so we have someone build our letter so uh, this thing is not necessary okay now we could do some more tinkering and just make this look nicer and not like this like this so but that's not what we want to learn right now so we simply copy the whole thing copy it and paste it easy peasy so and now we start modeling our stairs Then we make it look more like it belongs here. Also for the back side. Uh, well, if I'm honest, this isn't even necessary to do. We just could use this. Copy it. Move it up. We just make to make sure that it's not the same depth like the previous stair and paste it like this. Oops. Then we again. We have our first simple stair steps, but we want them to reach the top of our wonderful ladder. I don't think we need three of this. So we copy it, check where the origin is. Ba -ba -ba. Paste it. Just make sure that it's not the same Steps as our previous. Okay, it's not the most beautiful. It's probably not the most beautiful letter you ever have seen. 
but it will work for our needs so we can use it. So we see the last two steps have the same um, depth so we cannot move further. That's why we need always to make sure that they a little bit different in their position like the previous one. Yeah, so if I would have put more effort into this wonderful ladder, we could have reached the top. And that's how you create stairs and ladders. Yeah. So, okay. Mm, small cubes. Jump. Oh yeah, jump. Jump is a really nice feature. If you have a, a map which is a little bit more huge than this one and we want easily to reach the position over there, we can just click somewhere in the in the direction and just hit J and we will teleport to, to the origin of the thing we have selected. For example, if I move a little bit up and have selected a few more cubes like this and hit J, we see we are teleported in the near of the actual selection. Not the center of our selection, the origin of our selection. And this is how you can move very fast through your map if you want to edit on certain on different areas. You can also increase your fly speed for this by um, using float speed and you can type a number between 1 and 1000. 1 is, well, pretty slow. You can see here it is um, small floating speeds is always useful if you want to model really 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 tiny things like this and you want to make something and don't want to move too fast while you're editing. And if you have a lot more bigger things to edit you can just easily set 1000 as an as of as, as your float speed and you're good to go. So okay. Flow speed. We have flow speed, we have rotations, high map, brushes, optimized geometry, we have talked about it. Have I forgotten something? No. Okay. Um, now let's start with the last part. PVS. PVS is used to determine which parts of the map are visible from another part of the map. If we fly a bit up, we see that the map is divided in its causes cells like this. You can determine the size of the cells the engine um, uses to determine which cell is from this cell visible. For example, oops, I show you in, in small. If you have a map which looks like this, boop, 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 boop. Boop. So this is our map, this is the border of our map. Just for quick demonstrating. So if we are for example in this cell of our map, we wouldn't be able to see oops, that part of our map because it is culled by the thing here in the middle. If this wouldn't be there we could easily see all regions of the map. So if this here we can see this, this. It is hard to tell if we could see this but maybe if we're on the edge here we can maybe have a glimpse on that or maybe also on that but we will never be able to see that cell. So everything which is inside this cell would just be killed, culled and will not um, given to the GPU to render. Okay, okay, let's demonstrate this. We have this beautiful tower, which is an inside and an outside. Now I hit enable the wireframe mode and we see, we can now see the hills on the back side of this wall, even if not possible. You see, if, we, if I look down, the engine on its own is already doing some some PVS while we're running. But these PVS are calculated at runtime. We can to, to, to decrease CPU usage and to increase GPU performance and think we can pre-calculate those view cells. By this, 
you can first use test PVS to just test how a PVS with a with a with a given size would look like. So, for example, if I set it to four, default as I think twelve or thirty-two. If I would say test PVS four, the engine would now, as you can see, uh, generate a test view cell of the size 4 at the position we are currently at. So if we now move outside our tower we see that even the map here is cold. The mountains are not visible but still there. As you can see I can move them still up and sink. So all of these cells are not even passed to the GPU for rendering and not um, not pass uh, and, and don't require extra CPU time to determine if they're visible or not because the engine knows okay we are already in cell let's call this cell cell X so cell um, Y and cell Z are not visible just because we just determined it before so okay to reverse this test um, PVS we can use lock PVS and set it to zero and then the current uh, the, the engine will now start generating and calculating the PVSs again if not already pre-calculated. So if we want to generate PVSs we can just use gen PVS and now we give the size of the PVS like 4. You see depending on the size of the cells you choose and this could take really long. Also um, if you look at my actual um, CPU usage, which is at 50%, I said um, you, you, you can. Also, the default behavior is um, PVS threads one. So if you now, like, you can now see on my CPU usage only one CPU core. Plus minus, I have 16 CPU cores, uh, 8 CPU cores, 16 threads. One thread is used for calculating this PVS, which does take even longer. So with the um, command um, PVS threads, you can tell Cube how many threads should be used to calculate those PVS. I recommend using the amount of threads your CPU have minus one if you're on Windows, if you're on Linux, I don't care. You can easily hit it to the maximum of course available, PVS thread 16. If I now would run Gen PVS 4, we see that the CPU usage is at 100% and also the calculation is a bit, um, a bit faster. So yeah, this is how you could optimize your map before anybody started the map or played on the map. So this is especially useful if you have weaker hardware, you want the map later on to be used on. Okay, Cube 2 on its own is not very resource hungry and things should work well even on a six year old notebook, but just keep it in mind you have this option to use it. I will wait to um, for it to calculate the PVS for each cell. 4 was not a good idea to use. The default size of these view sets is 32, I think, which is a lot bigger, but also this is less accurate. Okay, the advantage of vaster view cell size is you need less RAM to actually store them and to know which cell is visible from which cell. And also the generation time is um, lower. But the disadvantage is... Um, that it's not as precise as a smaller um, cell size. Uh, I show you if it is done calculating the PVS on our little example map. Dum -da -dum -da -dum -da -dum -da -dum. I should have choose the smaller number. Yeah, done. So, okay. So, we are here. If we have already pre-calculated PVS, 
we can run a little command called block pvs like before just with the parameter one which will lock the pvs shown from the cell in which we were in so like you can see here so test pvs is used for calculating one pvs for the current cell you're currently in and lock it if you have already generated pvs and you want to test them from various positions of your map for whatever reason you can use this lock pvs if i set it back to zero you see the map will reappear so if we are on this side maybe i can still lock the pvs and see which cells are now hidden and we see some parts of our um, tower is missing but it is still there because i can still shoot it and we see all the decals are in the air so yeah it's a nice thing to calculate also this is nice if we are in the edit mode and hit the wireframe mode we can see how the pvs actually work when we're moving around We see there is a lot of things which are called sometimes. So yeah, the, the calculation time was a lot longer and it's not even a big map and it's not very detailed. Uh, but also the RAM usage is a, little, is, is, is a little bit higher. So yeah, so much for PVS. Now, at the end, I want to add something to the high map thing. We cannot just use them to build hills we can also try to make caves with it so if we look at the top of a cube and hit h the high mode high map mode oops wrong brush would work in this direction if we hit the side of a cube and hit h the high map mode will work in this direction but as you can see there is no transition between faces in that direction to faces which are looking in this direction as you can see here so i recommend using this only if you want to illustrate some cliffs maybe and well put some water below here and maybe some dead zones and nobody would ever notice that this is just flat ground so yeah you can use this to make some some cool looking cliffs Maybe you can build the border of your map like this and yeah. But it is not advice it is not a wise idea to use this to actually build caves you want to walk through like in the map Xenon. I will save the whole thing. Saving PVS, which obviously take, takes a lot longer. Um map Xenon. I just want to use the Xenon map to illustrate you a few things. So you may already know this map if you're not so now you know. I want to increase my float speed. Float speed 1000. So, okay. You see, we have this vast huge map. This map also has um, caves. So if you want to build things like this, I do not recommend using high maps. And also, you see that the original map author also did not check any border to fit exactly the way they want. So yeah, building caves like this in, in the cube engine could be somewhat difficult. So my advice is, if you want to build a map which is um, which has some hills like this Long and some. Ten seconds hold it and some 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 caves maybe and some cliffs is doing the high maps first before you do anything else first do the high maps and then if you're done with the high maps you can start modeling your map into the high map in the high map to map map you already did so i assume they did the same here so they just used some high map brushes and made some cliffs here and some here and here and here. And then they start modeling the buildings inside the whole thing. Because if you just do simple buildings, they will not override or cause some weird fragments. So, okay, 
Also, we can check the PBS of this map. As you can see, if I move inside this cave, the geometry below there is missing. Now it's still it's, it's again visible. You can also just lock the PBS. Oops, as I already showed, like this. If we now move out of it, we see that geometry is hidden, which is still there. Yeah, it's, it's just it, I just choose this map because I know it is. It has some really cool looking PVS. Also here, the stairs are still there. Also the room below here is somewhere here. I don't know where to go. I think somewhere here. And you can leave and things and yeah. PVS. So you know. High maps. So you know. And I would say that's it for today's video and um, thank you for watching and damn I wasn't able to make the video a lot shorter because modeling is just a lot of stuff to know but yeah I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope we will meet again in the texture tutorial where we learn how to texture things at all how to make some cool blend maps so you have some smooth texture transition like this also, we will learn how to use specularity maps and normal maps and also I will teach you how to use parallax maps and what for texture types are there and for what they are used and so on and on and on. Yeah, then there will of course be a video about lightning, but that uh, lighting, but that will be later on. So yeah, the next video will focusing around everything you need to know about texturing, how to apply textures, how to reset textures, how to import your own textures which texture types you have, how to how to generate your own textures if you already have some texture for something. I will use GIMP for this, a little spoiler. And I will show you how to scale, rotate, how to colorize textures in game. Yeah, you can actually use a texture and multiply a color to it to make it look some reddish or bluish, whatever. Yeah. That's all. Uh, that's and that's and a uh, few things more. I will teach you in the next lesson when we talk about texturing. So I hope you enjoyed today's video and you learned something. And uh, yeah, if you have any suggestions, any further questions, please let me know. I'm always open for questions and also criticism if you think eh, your English is bad, because if you may have already noticed, I'm not a native English speak speaker and I'm not used to speak English very often, so yeah, please be kind with me. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you for watching, see you in the next video, bye bye.